Okay, welcome to the third of our History of Medicine lectures and course sessions for this year. As you know, the, um, the theme of the year is uh, living history. And we have uh, in the Texas Medical Center examples of the most amazing stories uh, and progress in the history of medicine in the, 20th, in the 21st century. Today, uh, we are delighted to have Dr. Emil Freireich, who's been at MD Anderson for 40 years? 50. 50 years, sorry about that. Um, Dr. Freireich is someone you may have seen in Ken Burns' documentary, The Emperor of All Maladies. It's also, he plays a, a key role in the book um, uh, by that title. Uh, I won't take up too much time introducing him. He has agreed to let me interrupt him, uh, so I will feel free to do so when necessary. But there are just a couple of things I wanted to say about him to set the stage. Um, when Dr. Freireich went to medical school, uh, he graduated in 1949, there were no courses on cancer. Okay. He was uh, a hematologist, and he was told by one of his bosses, go cure childhood leukemia. Um, and when he began, children were bleeding out. Uh, they were dying of all kinds of hemorrhages, blood all over the place. And one of the first things he did was to figure out how to get the blood coagulated so that they could be stabilized. Uh, another thing he did that's completely revolutionary was he invented with an, with an engineer, he invented the blood separator, separation of plasma, white cells, and red cells, which you will find in every single uh, hospital in the world and are absolutely necessary for many procedures including uh, heart, uh, including transplants. And the last thing, just quickly to mention, I asked him yesterday, what were the three major contributions? The last thing, um, which is equally, if not more important um, than the others, is uh, Dr. Freireich invented ways of curing childhood leukemia. He had the idea that cancer could be cured. And he began experimenting with multiple chemotherapeutic agents. And today we are in a situation where 92% of all children with leukemia um, survive. So um, you can tell we are in the presence of a truly great physician, scientist, uh, and, and, and human being. So um, I thought I might start at the human level with um, your 1946 Pontiac Fastback. And when you got a call that uh, you and your wife and children had to move uh, to Washington, D.C., or Bethesda. And how that, how that happened? How did it happen? What happened? Oh. You, you got, what, what call did you get, from whom, and what did you do? Well, uh, during the war, there was a doctor draft. And I got deferred because I was working on radioisotopes with a famous Dr. Joe Ross at Mass Memorial Hospital in Boston for my hematology fellowship. And uh, the Supreme Court ruled at that moment in history that uh, it was unconstitutional to draft people based on their profession. So the doctor draft ended and the army reacted by and drafting every physician who had not served a two-year term in the military. And I got a letter one day when I was working in a lab in the middle of the night, married to my wife with one uh, one-year-old child and a pregnant wife. And in those days, the fellows did all the research, as you know. And we were doing, we were, Joe Ross was one of the first to get radioisotopes to study the lifespan of red cells with iron-59, treat thyroid with I-131, get FE-55. Uh, chromium-51 for labeling platelets and so on. So we were radioactive anything. And uh, I got this letter one day and it said, you're now a second lieutenant in the Army Reserve. So I didn't know what that meant. I called the guy. I said, we'll call you when we need you. So I kept doing my work. One day I got a call from the president of our institution, Dr. Chester Scott Kiefer. And probably most of you don't know Dr. Kiefer. He was a very famous physician scientist. He was the president of Mass Memorial. And when Eisenhower was elected president, he 
consolidated three cabinet levels, health, education, and welfare. The first secretary was Avita Kalpabi, who was the publisher of the Houston Post. And she immediately appointed an undersecretary of health, an undersecretary of education, an undersecretary of welfare. And Dr. Kiefer agreed to be undersecretary of health. And, but he maintained his role as the president of the Boston University School of Medicine, uh, which, by the way, had a research institute analogous to the Rockefeller Institute. That is, we had physicians whose responsibilities were primarily their clinical research and little service work, separate from the uh, runnings of the Boston University Hospital. So I got a call one day, Dr. Kiefer said, come to his office, I came to the office, he said, your boss, Dr. Ross, says you're doing a good job on research. I said, thank you, sir. He said, uh, have you ever heard of the National Institutes of Health? No, sir. Well, he said, Dr. Ross tells me you've been drafted. It turns out that if you enlist in the public health service, before the army gets you, you can serve your mandatory military time in the public health service. And you can do research at the new, newly opened clinical center of the National Institutes of Health. He said so, he picked up his hotline, Fred, there's a guy coming to see you tomorrow, Freireich, F-R-E-I-R-E-I-Z. -E -E so I jumped in my little car, drove to Washington, met Fred, Fred said, get on the bus, go out to Bethesda, interview with all the clinical directors. I met Gordon Zubron, who had come out of the malaria program. He was the scientific director of the Cancer Institute, and he said, Freireich, what do you do? I said, I'm a hematologist. As you said, you ought to cure leukemia. I said, yes, sir. So uh, we began our career Immediately, from the time I met Zubrod, I went home. 24 hours later, I got orders from the Public Health Service to report to active duty in the clinical center. And I was in the midst of all my research. I hadn't finished any of the publications. So we packed everything we had. We took our one-year-old child and our pregnant wife. We went to Bethesda and we met Dr. Zubrod. And he said, your office is on the 10th floor. I went up the 10th floor and I was walking down the hall. Emil Fry the Third. Golly, isn't that like the government? They can't even spell my name right. <laughs> so I walked in there was this tall, skinny guy with no hair. So I said, sir, you're in my office. He said, no, you're next door. I'm Fry, you're Fry right. And, <laughs> and we became lifelong friends and associates. His family and my family, he and I were like brothers. And uh, we collaborated on all of our research. And tragically, about 25 years ago, he developed terrible Parkinson's disease, which took him out of medicine entirely. And uh, we watched him, if you've ever seen a Parkinson's patient, we watched him get separated from the world in the most painful way. And he's passed. But uh, we went to work. Dr. James Holland, who has been 90 years a scientist, had preceded me to the clinical center, and he started treating children with these drugs, methotrexate, 6 mp prednisone, and uh, he was getting some progress, but he got a job offer to go to Roswell Park, he left, and the reason Zubrod hired me is he needed someone to take care of these kids who were dying in, in the hospital. So I walked in the first day, and the chief of, and Dr. Fry said, you know, those are your patients. Well, the first thing I did was read the literature. And everything that was published by the world's experts said that what we're doing with these drugs is prolonging the agony of dying of these children. Hopeless. Remember in 1965, correction, in 1955, the ethos in the academic medical center, medical community, was that there would never be a chemical that would cure a cancer because the cancer, as far as one could tell, biochemically and biologically, was a part of your own genome. 
they were not aware of whole genome sequencing and mutations and all that stuff. So everybody thought it was foolish to think of curing cancer. But we decided we would try. So the first thing we did was take a lesson from the infectious disease community and start using drugs in combination rather than in sequence. And for tuberculosis, it turned out that if you use streptomycin alone, they all become resistant. If you follow with PAA, parasit, PAS, they would get responses and they would relapse. So all the TB patients with systemic disease died. But when they discovered that you've used the two of them together, you would avoid the development of resistance and a fraction of the patients were cured with that combination. And so Dr. Zubrod, an infectious disease guy, said that's the way to start. So we started looking at combinations of the three drugs we had and different permutations. And uh, we made some progress. Uh, when our first publication came out, the cooperative group was Dr. Holland in, Rod in Buffalo and us. Our second protocol, we had 10 academic institutions. Everybody realized that doing objective, quantitative clinical research, you could build on your knowledge and make progress. Now, these were the first randomized clinical trials in cancer. In cancer. And it was the first cooperative group in the United States. Called, it, it was called the Acute Leukemia Cooperative Group. Uh, when Birchenol, who was at Memorial, made a second cooperative group, he called it Leukemia A to discriminate it from us, but no one could discriminate, so we called it B. So Acute Leukemia Cooperative Group B was the first cooperative group. But, excuse me, but as you, you told me yesterday, these kids were dying, right? They were bleeding out. 100% mortality you by a year. treat them because they were dying They all bled out. to death. And if you can imagine a four-year-old child in his mother's arms bleeding to death, that's what we had to face. So Dr. Zubrod came on rounds one day and he said, Freyreich, you got to do something about the bleeding because none of the chemotherapy could be administered because the children died of hemorrhage before we could get to them. Hemorrhage and hemorrhage and infection combined accounted for 95% of the deaths before leukemia could get them. So I went to work on that problem and uh, as you have mentioned, the, it had been conclusively shown in experimental animals, dogs, cats, rats, monkeys, that the cause of the hemorrhage was not the low platelets, which was true. It was some circulating anticoagulant. The way that was proven is they fereced the animals till they had no platelets in circulation and they still didn't bleed. But if you gave them a little bit of heparin, they bled to death. So the ethos was that platelet transfusions were futile as long as you had this anticoagulant. So the anecdote I told this in a book is I had a patient, I don't know if I told you this, but I remember him like it was today. His father was a minister in Washington, D.C. And I had the idea that if we could exchange transfuse a child who was bleeding, we would replace the platelets and the blood. What does exchange transfuse mean? Exchange means that you're going to re replace the patient's blood with normal blood. That's done for erythroblastosis fetalis in children. And the way it's done is I get a normal donor and I take 50 cc's of blood out of the donor. Then I get the, with an anticoagulant, then I get the patient, 50 cc's out of the patient, squirt it in the trash can, put the 50 cc's in. And it turns out that the, the, anatom, the arithmetic of that is that if you, trans, if you replace two times the recipient's blood volume, you'll have 50% of all the values normal. All the values will be 50% like the donors, normal. So we did that to this young child. His name was Scotty Didsmore. I'm sure his father wouldn't mind me. I've actually published his name in a book when I told this anecdote. And uh, after we did the exchange transfusion, 
Scotty stopped bleeding entirely. He was a normal child. Where did you get the blood from? The father brought 10 volunteers from his church. (laughs) They lined up, and each one donated 250 cc's, which is less than a blood donation. Then the next donor came. So I sat there for about six hours doing this procedure. We didn't have any house staff or technicians and stuff. But Scotty stopped bleeding immediately. So we had proven that if you replace the plasma and the platelets, you control the hemorrhage. But we were smart. We kept counting the platelets. And as the platelet count, the platelets have a half-life of about four days. As the platelet count went down, when it got to a level of about 5,000, the bleeding recurred. Aha. Uh-huh. So I went to the medical records of the children who died, and I compared the notes of the doctors and nurses for when the patients were bleeding and what their platelet count was, and we showed that there was a direct relationship between the platelet count and the occurrence of hemorrhage. So that's not a coincidence. And Scotty's platelet count followed the pattern. He started bleeding when the platelet count got below 5,000. So with that knowledge, I knew what I had to do. I had to transfuse platelets. Problem. Should I go into this? Yes. Well, the way we collected blood in 1955, steel needles, rubber tubing, glass bottles. Everybody knows what happens to platelets in that circumstance. And everybody does not know what happens to platelets. <laughs> platelets adhere to, to wettable surfaces. So there were no platelets in the blood. So if you transfuse fresh blood, collected that way, no place. So we had to go to Fenwall, who invented plastic bags for shipping plasma overseas during the war. We got plastic tubing, plastic bags, coated our needles with silicone so they were non-wettable, collected blood. We had 100% of the platelets in the bag. Problem number two, how long did the platelets stay in the bag? So we counted platelets for the next five days, And it turns out that by 48 hours, the platelets are all dead. We need fresh blood. Well, anyhow, that's a long story. We had to fight to get fresh blood because banks, blood banks only issue the oldest blood, not the youngest blood. If you distribute the young blood for transfusion, the blood bank runs out of blood, right? So we had a big social battle, and with Zubron's support, we succeeded, and we demonstrated quantitatively that platelet transfusion could control hemorrhage. We got volunteers to donate platelets so that we could define the limits of donation. Uh, We demonstrated that a normal adult can donate uh, two 500cc units of platelets twice a week, and his platelet count would not go down. Those are standards that are still used today, uh, 55 years later. And so we could get one adult volunteer, a parent usually, to maintain a child free of hemorrhage by giving platelets twice a week, half-life four days. And hemorrhage as a cause of death vanished in a week. It seems to me you were very meek and mild in pursuing this. (laughs) We were meek and mild. We had to fight the the entire establishment. It turned out that the the director of our laboratory medicine program, George Brecker, was one of the pioneers in identifying the causes of hemorrhage after the atom bomb events in Japan. And uh, he had he was he could never be convinced that his animal data was wrong. So what Dr. Zubrod thought of doing was we did a randomized trial, fresh blood versus bank blood. In children with the same indication, we measured all bleeding parameters. We quantitated the amount of blood out of the nose, out of the mouth, urine, stool, bleeding time. So we didn't have subjective but objective data. We did the randomized trial. It was done blind. We had a statistician. We had the blood bank people, we had Dr. Zubrod. After we did something like 15 patients, we broke the code 
And the coat, it was obvious that the fresh blood worked and the, none of the patients got blank blood work. And the consequence of that positive result was a citation classic in New England Journal. And uh, Dr. Brecker refused to have his name on the paper. <laughs> and uh, why was that? Well, because he wasn't convinced. It turned out once we knew the truth that the reason Brecker was convinced is that when you eliminate all the platelets in an experimental animal, they bleed into the soft tissue, and that red cells are picked up in the thoracic duct lymph and poured back into the blood. So there is no visible hemorrhage when an animal is depleted of platelets. But in humans, we are, are, all our vessels are on the surface. We don't have, you know, animal skin. So it was clear that when we learned to cannulate the thoracic duct, we were able to show that in the dog, in all the species, rats, rabbits, the same physiology occurred. When the platelet counts, the direct relationship between the platelet counts and the amount of blood in the lymph. So once you got the bleeding stopped, tell, ah. us, tell the story of the blood separator. Ah. Well, once the bleeding was stopped, uh, the leading cause of death was now infection. And we had antibiotics, but a limited spectrum of antibiotics, <laughs> and the children all died of infection when their counts were low. So we, doctor, one of my good friends and I were in the backyard, we said, you know what we need to do? We need to transfuse white cells. So we did the same kind of a study that we did with the platelets. That is, we looked at the charts, we compared the level of neutrophils to the occurrence of hemorrhage, and again, a citation classic. Uh, there was a direct relationship between the number of neutrophils. We all know that now. Tell, I mean, tell the rest of us who don't know neutrophils what they are. Uh, polymorphic nuclear leukocytes. These are the great. Tell us what leukocytes are. White cells. <laughs> White cells. You all got that? Okay. They're, they're leukocytes. And, uh, and so when we showed that the level was directly related to the occurrence of, ham of infection, we wanted to repeat the platelet scenario. So we had to collect white cells. Problem. I spent a year trying to figure out how to collect white cells. And the reason that they're hard to collect is that in a centrifuge, the plasma is in the supernate. If you centrifuge at a low centrifuge, centrifugal force, the platelets remain in the plasma, so we can collect 80% of the platelets by separating plasma from the rest of the blood. But the leukocytes are trapped in the trapped red cell layer, so the Buffy coat is devoid of white cells. So you got to get some way to get the white cells out of the red cells. And I scoured the literature and I discovered a good friend of mine who had used hydroxyethylated starch for treating shock to expand plasma volume. And it turns out that any macromolecule will make red cells rouleau. Everybody knows what rouleau is. What no, I do. don't think so. Rouleau is what you do when you're gambling, when you stack up your coins. The red cells will stack up in layers. I didn't know you played poker. <laughs> I've seen it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we added fibrinogen and it worked beautifully. But fibrinogen carries viruses and so on. It's not a suitable thing. We discovered hydroxyethyl starch. It worked as well as fibrinogen. We got all the clearances in those days. You couldn't do it today. But since it had been given, been given to man as a volume expander, we added hydroxyethyl starch to the incoming blood and separated the white cells into the Buffy coat. And the next problem was how to collect supernate, precipitate, and Buffy coat. Explain those three terms for those, those of us who don't quite get it. Supernate. Supernate is the top and precipitate on the bottom. Buffy coat's in the middle. So I I started working with uh, pumps from the Heart Institute and uh, tubing and plastic bottles and I was building a centrifuge. And one day 
a, a young engineer from IBM appeared in my office. He said, my name is George Judson. His son had developed leukemia and he came to the clinical center and his doctor was Jerry Block, one of my colleagues. And he said to Jerry Block, is there anything I can do as an engineer to help my son? Jerry Block said, there's a crazy guy on the 12th floor who's trying to build a centrifuge, go see him. So he appeared in my office. So I explained what I wanted to do. I wrote down the 10 things I wanted the instrument to do. You know, no damage the red cells, collect the play of the spine and so on. And he took those 10 things and he went away. And I thought it'd be the last I'd see of George Judson. But what he did is he got sabbatical leave from IBM to spend his full time on this project. And in about three months, he came back with the contraption, 12 pieces, you know, a pump of this. He said, I think we've got it. And he set it up in my lab. And we ran blood from the blood bank, which was not transfusable. And by golly, the thing had promise. We had to solve a number of problems, of course. So in order to do that, we needed money. We applied for a contract at the Cancer Institute, and it was approved. So the instrument was developed with funds from the Cancer Institute, not IBM. So the consequence is that even though I invented the machine, there's no copyright. It's in the public domain. So I didn't make any money, but that was okay. This is very unlike contemporary commercial interest in experiments yeah. in biotech. Different now. So we went to work, and the main problem we had to overcome was the connection between the rotating drum, which the centrifuge, and the stable part, which collects the stuff. And we discovered that Oak Ridge had used what's called face seals to connect rotating separating parts. And a face seal is a, 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 a collection device which is flatter than one wavelength of light, so no, red, no cell could cross the border. And we used these face seals, it's a long story. But anyway, we subsequently found that we didn't have to be so technical. You could use the jump rope principle. You know, if you jump rope, one guy holds it, and the other guy twirls, and that actually works in the blood cell separator now. There are, there are three jump ropes that collect supernate, precipitate, buffy coat. Then we had to work out how to visualize the buffy coat. We did it with a strobe light manually, but now it's all automated. We have uh, an instrument which any technician can operate. You plug in vein to vein, hydroxyethyl starch, the plasma is one thing, red cells another thing, and the buffy coat and the third thing, and you can do whatever you want. And the important thing is that one of my associates, Ken McCready, discovered that hematopoietic stem cells are circulating in the blood. It's, a, it's another citation classic. And, he, and we then looked for where the stem cells were in the, in the blood cell supper, and they were in the buffy coat. So we could do, we did the first allo transplants and auto transplants using peripheral blood instead of bone. The way bone marrow was collected <laughs> is you had to do multiple punctures along the hip. You had to go in the hospital, you had to get a blood transfusion because you lost a ton of blood. But now, Blood donation, you get stem cells, and you do it autologous or allogeneic transplant. So let me just interrupt again here. So after you got the blood separator, what was the clinical importance of this, and how did it help you move on to the next stage of what you were doing? Well, the blood cell separator can do everything. Stem cells for allotransplant, red cell exchange for treating sickle cell anemia. Uh, it's used to deplete patients with hyperleukocytosis who are susceptible to having cerebral hemorrhage. It's, you can deplete uh, platelet excess for patients with thrombosis and so on. You can do anything you want. What did it do for your children? Ah, uh, it, it did exactly like the platelets. We discovered that there was a dose response. We knew how many platelets. Limits of donation worked out in volunteer donors. We got as many, we found that one donor could donate white cells 
every other day because the granulocytes have a half-life of six hours in the circulation. There's an enormous granulocyte reserve in the bone marrow. So we give them a mobilizing agent to get them out of the bone marrow so we get their counts up to 10, 12,000. We take out all their white cells, we give them to the children, and hemorrhage and infection was controlled not as effectively as the, as the platelets and hemorrhage because there were organisms that are not as susceptible like fungal infection and some of the uh, gram-negative organisms, but to a large extent, infection was controlled. Okay, so let me stop again. So if I understand you, first you stopped hemorrhage. hemorrhaging, then you stopped the infection right. that they started dying from, and then... Now we could start the chemotherapy experiments because the children could resist the major side effects of the chemotherapy. So then we went from two drug combinations to three drug combinations to four drug combinations. And the fourth drug was the amazing drug vincristine, which is still used today. Vincristine, amethopterin, mercaptopurine, prednisone were the four drugs. And we put them together because they had different dose-limiting toxicities. Methotrexate 6-MP are in myelosuppressive, two-thirds of a dose of these two, full dose of prednisone, full dose of vincristine. The results were miraculous. Of the first 20 or so children, 90% went into remission in two weeks. So a child came in bleeding to death with infection, ready to die. We'd give them vamp. In 10 days, they were normal. But many people objected to treating dying, oh, yeah. dying children. They thought you were just prolonging their agony. Oh, yeah. What did you say to them? Well, I said, you know, <laughs> what my wife says. Every day is a gift of time. You may prolong agony, but the parents are very grateful, and the kids are happy. We had a colleague, Myron Karen, who was a pediatrician, and he used to sit and interview the children to see what they thought about it. And they didn't think they were being tortured. They were happy playing. And, the, and a four-year-old's major concern when he's dying of leukemia is don't tell my mother I'm sick. Mm. They're a major concern as to how their parents react. But they, they were sure happy to be cured. And by the time we had followed them for about three years, well, we learned several things about how to do this. We got them into remission, they all relapsed. Then we had to intensify the treatment while they were in remission. Then we had to do intermittent reinduction. And finally, we published in 1964 a paper that claimed that we had cured childhood leukemia, which proved to be true. And of the 30 children that we treated on those early studies, something like 15 of them are still alive. They appeared on the cover of Cancer Research when they had an anniversary issue. Uh, and I still hear from them. Amazing. So that's the reason I came to M.D. Anderson. Dr. Clark said, you got to come here and cure childhood leukemia. I said, great. And then I met Suto and Sullivan. <laughs> and they said, this is too toxic. Who's Sullivan? Pat Sullivan. She was a pediatrician staff. Uh, and the cooperative group, Don Fernbach, and the group at uh, Children's Hospital, too toxic. They wouldn't do it. So I became an adult doctor. I tried to apply the same principles to adult leukemia. And of course, we've succeeded. Now, adult leukemia is much more complicated than childhood leukemia. These are partially differentiated cells. They have very complex mutations, so their genetic background is much less homogeneous. And, uh, but in the 50 years I've been here, we've seen a disease which is 100% lethal become, uh, let's see, about 30% of the patients are literally cured. The other 70% have very substantial palliation mounting almost to cure. Uh, we have palliative therapy for all kinds of leukemia. 
The ones who have complex cytogenetics with advanced disease are still a problem for us. But uh, in the chronic leukemias, CML, Jordan Gutterman, Evan Hirsch discovered interferon. Interferon suppressed the Philadelphia chromosome, which is a marker of CML. That gave, uh, what's his name in, in uh, Portland, the idea of small molecule inhibiting the binding site of BCR ABO, which is a kinase. And if you inhibit the binding site, uh, it's paralyzed and the patient's going to complete remission okay, I think, magically. I think you might have lost two thirds of us there. But let's go back to coming to Houston. How did Dr. Clark get you all the way to Houston? That's a Houston one. was uh, you know, not very much of a significant city. It had no serious medical center. Um, he no. must have done something. No, and uh, MD Anderson was a big place I don't remember the number of beds. It was about 85. What year and, was this? Huh? What year? 65. I've been there 50 years. And, and the Texas Medical Center was, thank goodness for Mike DeBakey. They brought Baylor. You know, the Texas Medical Center purchased Baylor Medical School, brought it here. So we had an academic center. A lot of our beginnings were collaboration with Baylor Children's Hospital. Uh, but we came, I give a little talk about Dr. Clark. He was a remarkable person because he recognized that Houston had all the ingredients to be a boom town. It was located upstream of Galveston where the major medical school was. No hurricanes. It was located on the ship channel, which had been built. And he saw the petrochemical industry booming and becoming a major industry. And he realized Houston would become a major port, major center of commerce. He predicted it would become the largest city in Texas and one of the biggest cities in the country. So when I arrived, they put me up in a motel. It was pretty deep. Well, let's go back to the story of how he got you here. Oh. He drove all the way to your house in Maryland. He came to Bethesda on an airplane. He was oh, rich. An and uh, <laughs> he actually found my home and came to my house and ate dinner with my wife and my four children. They were ages uh, 5 to 11. And convinced my wife <laughs> that we had to go to Boston. We had to go to Bethesda. He was a remarkable person. Uh, he... You had to go to Houston. Houston. Had to go to Texas. My wife, when she heard the news, she ran out and bought nylons. She thought we'd see Indians <laughs> in 1965. It was a ding town in 1965. But what were nylons going to do to protect her? She could look good in her stockings. She thought they didn't have them yet in Texas. Oh, okay. You know, in 1965, Texas was not it was a very small state, just about to boom. Uh, but everything Dr. Clark predicted came true. He predicted MD Anderson would have no limits. Cancer was the number one problem. He had all the ingredients. He only needed the medical school. And if we came and brought NIH investigative medicine, that MD Anderson would boom, and it did. And you were a key part in the booming of oh, MD yeah. Anderson. Tell us a little bit more about what he gave you and how you helped grow MD Anderson. Well, Clark was a politically very important. And we had come from the Cancer Institute, and in the 60s, when everybody realized the importance of full-time clinical research, all the academic medical centers wanted NIHs. At that time, there was only Boston University had a clinical center, Rockefeller, very few academic medical centers had full-time clinical research centers. 
But, excuse me. I think I'm talking too much. No, not yet. We'll take some questions in a few minutes, but I think most of us could listen a lot longer. So, we utilized Clark's political influence and our experience at the Clinical Center to start applying for grants. The grant program started in the early 60s. So we had served on study sections and we knew how it worked. So we applied for grants. We got a clinical center grant, which allowed us to fund several projects. And we got a training grant, the first training grant in Texas. And the training grant allowed us to recruit young physician scientists and cover their salaries and their expenses so they had no service requirements. They simply could do their research. They could do academic things, take courses at the university, and so on and so forth. And the consequence of that was that we had a Fry Wright Day on the 23rd of October. And Honoring we, you? Huh? Honoring you. Yeah. And we had 10 of our alumni from the 70s who came back. These people were giants. They're people who cured lymphoma and leukemia and uh, cancers of all organs, testis, lymph, uh, breast cancer, colon cancer. They gave talks. We recruited men who were motivated, like the clinical center. And they came, and they were, had enough salary. People like Michael Keating, who cured chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Ken McCready, who found the stem cells. Cabanillas, who cured large cell lymphoma. Uh, Dr. Hurtabaji, who made a tremendous advance in breast cancer, so on and so forth. So these young men were highly motivated. They came because we had a training grant. We had a, gave them the time to and the freedom and the resources. And the consequence of that was our practices grew and the patient income grew and the hospital grew. <laughs> but let me say one thing that should be obvious, but uh, you must have been one hell of a mentor to attract so many people who I'll went on to be you, so good. I am so honored in my old age. Uh, just last month I received the Lifetime Mentorship Award mm. at MD Anderson. There's only been one, there will be others. Uh, yeah, mentoring is my skill. And uh, I've spent the last 10 years of my career full time, 70% of my time in education. I, have a, I teach in the graduate school. I've been a full member of the graduate school from day one. I've been a full professor from day one. And uh, I love to teach, and uh, my students are all smarter than I am. They all do more than I do, have accomplished more than I do. I get credit for them, but they're, uh, we've got a tremendous group of people. Evan Hirsch, Jerry Bodie. So I, I want to get into a topic that I know you have very strong feelings about, and um, we may need to, I may need to cut you off before we go too far, so we'll right. have time for questions. But we talked about this yesterday. Um, if you tried to do these... Impossible. Yeah. These experiments today, why would they not be possible? Well, because the federal government. <laughs> you know what the definition of a liberal is? Liberals know best what's good for you than you do. They're always making rules. The federal government regulates all aspects of medicine, in particular investigative medicine. The FDA, if you go to Washington and you look for the FDA, they have a bigger building and more employees than MD Anderson. I mean, they've got thousands of people whose job it is to interfere 
with research. That's their job. If you hire a guy for the FDA, he's smart, he's capable, he's well-educated, and you say, here's your job. Freireich wants to give patients four drugs. What do you think? So he looks at it and he says, great idea. But if I approve this and somebody in Keokuk, West Virginia dies, that's my ass in a sling. I'm not going to approve it. If I, if I approve it and it cures everybody, I don't get any credit. But what about local IRBs? What about the experimentation that still the, goes on? The IRBs are a derivative of the FDA. It's but outside. you do plenty of research, MD Anderson. Yeah. We do a lot of research, but it takes... I did a white cell protocol about three years ago. It took, on average, for our IRB to approve a protocol, on average, 14 months. By that time, the problem is solved, you know. But once you get through the IRB, if you're doing anything to patients, you've got the FDA to contend with. Even when IRBs approve it and you have preliminary results, the FDA, should I tell you the anecdote that I told you? I don't think I can stop you. <laughs> well, I don't, does anyone know who George Hitchings was? George Hitchings was a biochemical pharmacologist who worked for, uh, it'll come to me in a moment, pharmaceutical industry, Burroughs Welcome. And he won Nobel Prize for devising anti-metabolites which interfere with purine pyrimidine metabolism. So the whole genetic, the whole basis of genetics was worked out by having specific anti-metabolites that interfere with each step in the biosynthesis of the macromolecules, DNA, RNA, protein, and so on. So Hitchings got a Nobel Prize. Uh, his collaborator, Rose Ruth Ellison, uh, Trudy Elian, Hitchings and Elian, devised the drugs that cure viral infection that are used everywhere in the world, and they synthesized 6-MP and many thiopurines, giant in research. And he was a good friend of mine. We all respected him. He was our mentor, so to speak. And I was sitting at a lunch table one day, and I happened to see, be sitting next to him, and I said, how are things going at Burroughs Rugg? And he said, well, I'll tell you an anecdote. I think we will have no new drugs in the future ever. I said, why do you say that? He said, well, we discovered in our labs that if you combine an antifol with a sulfonilamide in a fixed ratio, that it's the most powerful antibacterial agent we know of. But the ratio has to be right. If you have too much antifold or too much, it doesn't work. So we went to the FDA and said, we want to market this drug in a fixed ratio in a single pill. The FDA laughed. No way. So they tried, so they went back to the lab and they did thousands of experiments. And he said, this actually happened. They loaded all the data into a truck, into a van, and they went to the FDA and they said, where do you want this data? And the guy said, put it over there. They took these trolleys and they piled up a half a room full of documents and the, the guy, the FDA official said, it's a shame you went to all this trouble. We're not going to prove it. <laughs> and they didn't. So the way it got approved was by sheer brute force. Burroughs Welcome had enough resources and enough money to do it. The drug is Bactrim, which we all take every day today. Within a month of its approval, it was the best-selling antibiotic in the world. And Burroughs Welcome became rich on Burroughs. And it's true. We face this obstacle. Uh, it's, it's so insane. You know, we, we have a protocol 
for patients who we know for sure have less than six weeks to live. And the patients are begging us to do something. And we have 10 brilliant ideas of which we pick the best one. It takes a year for the FDA to approve it, if they do. And if you take what we did in one year, it would have taken us 10 years. I would have been in Houston before we turned childhood leukemia. But in those days, we had an external advisory committee to be sure we weren't experimenting on people. It was a new thing. And Max Wintrobe was on it, and he came around and said, this is terrible, you shouldn't be doing this. And we did bone marrows to quantitate the effect on it. He said, you shouldn't do bone marrows, too painful, just count the blood. Uh, so our advisors were very negative, but our leadership was very positive. Dr. Zubrod, uh, all the Cancer Institute leadership, they wanted to make progress. They had to make progress to justify their budgets. They had to go to Congress every year and say, here's what we're doing. So we were able to move, but today we have, we have drugs that can prolong this. A, a patient with pancreatic leukemia had an expected lifespan of about three years and 100% mortality by 10 years. Today, at 10 years, 90% are not only alive, but free of disease. And all they do is take a pill every day. A pill, not a shot, nothing. Can I interrupt you there? Well, the amazing thing is that that took so long to do. You have no idea what we had to go through to get Gleevec approved, a randomized double-blind study where patients who had the disease had to be randomized to getting nothing. That's human experimentation at the worst. If I were a patient, I would never agree to that. We knew Gleevec worked. It worked in tissue culture. It worked in animals. It worked in transplant. Guys. Crazy. So there are many ethical issues and strong opinions yeah. about clinical research today and the limits of IRBs and the limits of the FDA uh, process. I wish we had time for you to talk about your childhood. Uh, oh. A very rough and tumble childhood in Chicago, uh, I think might have given him some of the toughness that he needed as he made his way um, through the ranks. But you know, uh, Malcolm Gladwell wrote this book. I forgot what the title of it was, but he, his thesis was that disadvantages are advantages. Because if you're crippled or blind or whatever your problem is, you get resources that you would not normally use. And growing up in a bad environment, going to a dink high school that was like Cotter on TV, there was no teaching, there were no professors. That was a big disadvantage. But in order to overcome it, I wanted to be a doctor. It took, what I tell all young students, all you have to do is know what you want to do and be persistent. All right. In Yiddish, we call this chutzpah. 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 Right. So how about some questions before uh, we have to break? Could you repeat it? Did you ever go back to pediatrics? Go back to what? Pediatrics. No. Uh, the pediatricians in the group voted that you had to have boards in pediatrics. I applied to the pediatric board. I said, I'm the only one who's cured childhood leukemia. They said, well, if you do a year of residency, we'll approve you. <laughs> so I worked on adults. But the pediatricians have done very well. Once, once the door was open, uh, I mean, all the principles were there. We knew early intensification, intermittent reinduction. You had to treat them for a year. Now we treat them for two years, uh, intermittent reinduction. And the answer's in. There are, the cure rate's 92%.
how did you determine a sequence and a schedule. schedule when you were just starting to do the experimentation? That's a very good question. Uh, when, you, when you're doing chemotherapy, the first thing you want to know is something about the pharmacology. When I came to Texas, the first person we recruited was T. Lee Lu, the head of pharmacology department. You want to know where the drug is absorbed, where it's excreted, and so on. If you know it's catabolism, then the second thing you know is the maximum tolerated dose. If you know, we did a study, which is a citation class, another citation. I have a hundred citation classes. But this one, what we did was we took animal data from Skipper and Shable of Southern Research and clinical data, and we made a model for predicting where you should start treatment. And of course the principle is that if you use the animal surface area and the human surface area, you can find the common ground. And we came up with the slogan of two-thirds of the maximum tolerated dose in the most sensitive species. It's used all over the world. It has been for the last 25 years because it's safe. We showed that if you get the 10% of the MTD in the most sensitive species, you could increase the dose 100% and never reach an LD10. So the way you start, get the MTD, third of the MTD, give it to patients if there's no toxicity, you double the dose. There's a, there are things, there are escalation schemes that are two-thirds of the seventh-tenth of the fifteenth. It's all a bunch of baloney. You're wasting your time, and you're wasting the patient's time. To get an effective dose, you have to be aggressive in phase one. And uh, we systematically do that. You start with a dose, 100% increments. When you get any side effects, then you go in small increments. You work out the pharmacology. Is that responsive? Well, as you can see, um, this is a person who transformed medicine in the 20th century, and it's an honor to have you with us. Uh, please give a round of applause to Dr. Simon. <laughs> <laughs>